I recently watched a movie about a father and daughter. They were living in a national park over in America, and he had some kind of fear of society from an earlier experience in life, what it was we're not told, and he was seeking isolation. And as the movie goes on, they get caught by the authorities, and they get all checked out, and the authorities try and assimilate them back into society. But the father and the daughter, after about a week, he says, come on, let's go. And they head off back into the wilderness. And then later on in the movie, they end up meeting a group of people in a trailer camp far away from the city. And it got me thinking about how we as human beings, we get restless. We always crave something other than what we've got. Often we... um, want more and then if we have more we want less we want to go out to the bush we want to go out into the the sea or whatever it is to restore our souls most of the time we're able to keep things in check either by distracting ourselves or by simply either being grateful or accepting our lack of ability to actually change our circumstances and yet something in us always desires something more We often return in church back to those verses about Abraham in Hebrews 11, who sought a heavenly city, not making for himself a palace here on earth. And we all await this heavenly city. Our hearts yearn for it. And we're restless because we're not there yet. And the old quote from St. Augustine comes to mind, that our heart is restless until it rests in God. And so today is Boxing Day the day after Christmas. And for many of us, this, it's a temporary respite from everything that happens throughout the year. And it's finally arrived, but we know that it won't last forever. We know that it will be short, but our final resting place is an eternity with God, and that's still ahead of us. And we yearn for it all the time. Last week we talked about Christmas and why it is that God came to earth to live as a human when he could have waved his figurative wand or his hand and absolved us all from our sins and selfishness. And we discovered that Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial law so that we no longer require the sacrifice of bulls and goats for our sins like the nation of Israel did. Jesus also fulfilled the moral law. He obeyed it fully and reshaped it for our lives today. And thirdly, he gave us his Holy Spirit. Instead of requiring a mediator to access God, we have God within us, leading us and helping us. So today, we're going to continue in this theme of how Jesus fulfilled the law by looking at what, in some parts of the Christian faith, uh, is a controversial topic. We're going to be talking about the Sabbath. Now, There's basically three options for what people believe regarding the Sabbath. Some believe that it's meant to be observed on a Saturday and they have separated off from the rest of Christianity to observe it on a Saturday um, and don't agree with it being on a Sunday, while others claim that it should be on Sunday. And in Israel, from where our faith comes, uh, the Sabbath begins at sundown on Friday and ends 24 hours later on Saturday night. So with a range of opinions about the Sabbath, what should we as New Testament Christians be doing to observe it? That's the question we're going to be talking about today. And as I mentioned last week, I've been going personally through the book of Hebrews. And I find it a very interesting book. It's somewhat on its own in the New Testament, somewhat unique. It's got no recorded author. There's no clear consensus on who wrote it. Some people are adamant that it was the Apostle Paul while others strongly oppose this theory. And in the order of books, it flows on from the Apostle Paul's writing just before James, Peter, and John's letters. But even the content in the book is quite different from other New Testament writings. It has almost a poetic character to it. Take the opening four verses, for example. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our Father by the prophets, to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son, through whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. 
He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, there's no evidence that the book of Hebrews was actually addressed to any particular group, but it gained its name through tradition as far back as the second century or earlier, the Hebrews. But its contents are undeniably focused on the nation of Israel and reinterpreting the Old Testament through a lens that was only now able to be applied after the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And I love this book for a number of reasons. Firstly, it talks about things that don't often get mentioned anywhere else, such as angels or people like Melchizedek. It also adds another angle to issues like the Sabbath, which don't really get talked about in any great depth in other parts of the New Testament. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So the question, what is the Sabbath and how should we observe it? Firstly, we observe the Sabbath because God told us to. In Genesis 2, 1 to 3, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on his seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So God created the, the world and everything um, in, seven, in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. And Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So God created everything in six days and on the seventh day he rested. And then he told the people of Israel that they were to remember this day and keep it holy. So firstly, we obey it because we're told to obey it in the Bible. Secondly, we obey it because it's good for us. We don't just do things according to blind faith. We do things because we know that God has our best interests at heart. Now, there's been many studies and discussions about the advantages of observing a Sabbath and not just within the church or within any religions. And if you think about it, God gave us the Sabbath not as a set of rules to be followed for no reason other than to please Him, but also as a provision for a time of rest for us. God didn't need the rest when He rested on the seventh day. He did it as an example for us so that we would do it as well. He gave it to us and He gave us permission to observe the Sabbath, to rest. That's why he worked for six days and took a break for the seventh, so that we would too. Now, here's a question. Do you have to be bored on your day off? Do you have to sit around doing nothing? No, of course you don't. But on the other side, do you have to dislike and find it a chore the six days that you have to work? No, you don't. Both work and Sabbath, rest are both gifts from God. He gave us these cycles and these rhythms. And if we had only one and not the other, we would find life rather boring and rather hard. And I may have mentioned previously about how my first job after tertiary education was an underpaid job in a hire shop. I even acted as a manager for three weeks with barely above the minimum wage. But eventually, knowing that there was no future for me in it, and that was just a temporary job, I quit. I decided I've had enough of this place, but I didn't have anywhere to go. So there's me at the age of 20, sitting around at home, bored, for five months. However, I had no idea what to do next, to do next. and initially I enjoyed the break from work, but eventually I loathed having nothing to do. It had been my dream for my whole life to sit around and do nothing, and then now I finally had it, I found it absolutely awful. I started volunteering at church and I eventually gained employment there. And 15 years later, this is where I am now. Things have changed a bit, but God led me into something and I'm so glad that I don't have nothing to do. But here's the point. 
too much rest made me yearn for work in a way that I had never anticipated ever experiencing when I was younger. And now on the other side of things, after a couple of hard years of COVID and being a parent and all of the stuff, change of circumstances, um, trying to, to do things when everything is a lot more difficult, when everything is so unsettled, I've been yearning for a break. And um, as much as work is good for us, at right now, maybe those five months would sound even more amazing than having anything to do. But see, the grass always looks greener on the other side. We're always yearning for something that we don't already have. And in reality, we need both work and rest. And God in his wisdom said that we should not work every single day. That would be too much but that we should have a break once a week, but that we should have something to do for those six days as well. Otherwise, rest on its own would be awful. Now, I often wonder about our society having a whole weekend off when God told us to have one day off. I do find that interesting. And we have a push now for three-day weekends. But on the other side of things, I think we don't really ever take a full day of rest. We often fill those days and we end up so busy It's not just talking about paid employment, it's talking about work versus rest. And sometimes we have days off that aren't restful at all. Um, And I like to, on my days off, get into, say, the garden and do work. It's not paid employment, but it's work in God's eyes. Anyway, I digress. So there are two reasons we observe the Sabbath. Firstly, because God told us to, and secondly, because it is good for us. But the question remains, How should we as Christians in the New Testament 2,000 years later, how should we observe the Sabbath? And this is where, for me at least, the book of Hebrews gets interesting. It doesn't just spell out the answer in one or two verses. It takes chapters and sometimes the whole book to answer questions. It interweaves the story of the Old Testament in light of the new, in light of what Jesus has done. And it eventually answers the question, not so much explicitly, more implicitly. So let's follow it today and see what it has got to say to us. Thirdly, Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath. I mentioned earlier a man named Melchizedek. Who knows about Melchizedek? Yeah? He's only mentioned in three different places in Scripture, and two of them are rather fleeting. He's mentioned in Genesis 14 in Psalm 110, and then in Hebrews chapters 5 to 7. So after not much mention at all, the writer of Hebrews then talks about him more than he's talked about in the Bible up to that point. We're going to read each of these verses, and then we're going to go through the verses in Hebrews in depth. So in Genesis 14, 18 to 20, Abraham had just defeated some of his enemies, and we read that Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine which I find very interesting. It's like a foreshadowing of communion. It says, He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Now, this is all that it says about him. And some people have uh, postulated that he might have been like a type of Jesus, that um, like Uh, when the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fire, um, that there was a fourth person come, and some people have have said that it might be Jesus or a person who's like Jesus. And it's the same that has been said about Melchizedek here. Um, So then it mentions it in Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so rather than trying to explain um, in great depth these references and context, I'm going to read them from Hebrews because Hebrews brings them both up and works them together. In chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. Now, this might be a little bit wordy, but we'll eventually get the point. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God. We talked about this last week. The high priest was there as sort of mediator between us and God, helping um, with things like paying for our sins with bulls and goats and whatnot. Uh, They were there in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. The high priest is like us, human, makes mistakes. 
Because of this, he's obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, that is, by God, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So here was this Melchizedek, who was a high priest, well and truly before we had uh, Aaron and Moses and the Israelites and the high priesthood that was set up after that. And now we have Jesus, who has become this high priest to carry on the Aaronic um, priesthood, but also to carry on this priesthood that God had set in place of Melchizedek well before the law was given. And Jesus has fulfilled that. These verses say that Jesus has become an eternal high priest, not just a temporary one like the Aaronic priesthood, but an eternal high priest. And the writer of Hebrews talks about how Melchizedek, there's no recorded um, birth for him. There's no recorded death for him. So in a way, his priesthood is eternal. It has no beginning and no end like Jesus. We discussed last week how Jesus, the eternal high priest, has replaced the temporary human high priest. We no longer need that earthly mediator. And we have no need for the Old Testament ceremonial and moral law. Rather, we come directly to Jesus for all of our needs to be met. And it says two chapters later in Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 3, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God Most High, he met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything he had. So here's this Melchizedek. He comes and um, blessed Abraham, and then Abraham gives him a tithe of all his stuff. He is first, the writer of Hebrews says, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem. That's what his name means, Melchizedek. Um, And king of Salem means king of peace. He's without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the son of God, resembling Jesus. And he continues as a priest forever. Verses four to uh, four to 10. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi, that is Abraham's offspring, the um, ones who became the priesthood, who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people. So the priesthood would receive the tithes from all the people according to the law. That is from their brothers, those who are also descended from Abraham. But this man, Melchizedek, who does not have any descent from from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises, blessed Abraham. It's beyond dispute, he says here, that the inferior is blessed by the superior. So Abraham was blessed by Melchizedek. So Abraham is the inferior and Melchizedek the superior. In in one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it testified that he lives. One might even say, the writer of Hebrews says, that Levi himself, who receives the tithes from all of his brothers, he, through his ancestor Abraham, paid tithes. For he was still in the loins, that he was still to be the ancestor of Melchizedek of, her, of um, Abraham when Melchizedek met him. So basically what he's saying, he's talking to the Hebrews, these people who believe in the law, who believe that Abraham, uh, their ancestor, was this great man um, who, through whom eventually the nation of Israel came. And then Moses um, gave them the law and they had the Aaronic priesthood through um, the Levites, through one of the um, 12 tribes of Israel. And they believed in things like tithing, Um, They believed in things like Sabbath, 
because of this law that was given to them. And then what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that before Abraham, there was this priest, Melchizedek, who carries on forever, who Jesus is an extension of. And he is far, far greater than uh, Abraham and than the law. And all of this stuff, it supersedes the law. It's not that it's come now and replaces something, but it always was. It was always God's intent, even before the law was given, that we would come to Jesus, the eternal high priest, rather than through mere mortal people. So what does this all mean for the Sabbath? Here's the point. God rested on the seventh day. Hundreds of years before the law was given to Moses and the Ten Commandments given as well, Abraham esteemed Melchizedek above himself and therefore above the law with its Levitical priesthood, etc. And the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus continues on forever in this order of Melchizedek. So essentially, the law was only for a time, the ceremonial law in particular and the moral law. And Jesus continues what God always intended that was around beforehand. Jesus fulfilled the law as we talked about last week. So, what do we do now? How then shall we live? In the New Testament, the believers met not on the Sabbath, but they met on the first day of the week, what we call the Lord's Day, um, which was the Sunday. And we continue this tradition for our church services, although society really treats Sunday like the last day of the week because we have the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. But Sunday was really the first day of the week, and a lot of people still see it that way. The point is that the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, they observed the Sabbath on Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Some Christians still do this, but New, Christians, uh, New Testament Christians in the time of the apostles met on Sunday. They met together on Sunday on the Lord's Day. And we still do that in church. 2,000 years later, we meet as Christians uh, on a, in a church service on a Sunday. However, it was the first day of the week back then, not the last. And it was a work day, not a day of rest. So the Sabbath and the Lord's Day had kind of become separated. The two concepts were not exactly celebrated at the same time on a Sunday. And what that book of the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying is that there is no longer any sort of particular day that we must observe out of legalism. We're not bound by the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. We come to Jesus. Coming to Jesus is far greater than doing these things that, we were, that the um, Israelites were told to observe. There's no legalism for us as Christians to observe the Sabbath. What Jesus is saying now is that he, the one who has fulfilled the law, he is our source of rest. Matthew 11 verses 28 to 30 says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, Jesus says, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In John 15 Verse 6 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And in verse 9, as the Father has loved you, has loved me, so have I loved you. Therefore, abide in my love, rest in my love, remain in my love. So the key is not when we observe the Sabbath or how we observe the Sabbath. It's not about rituals or regulations such as not lifting a finger on the whole day or attending a church service or avoiding work. Rather, the Sabbath is about coming to Jesus for everything. It's about putting him first so that all the other things in life will be supplied by him. As Matthew says in chapter 6, verses 31 to 33, Therefore don't be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. Those of the world seek after these things. But your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. We do need rest, but we don't just need it for two weeks every year. We don't just need it once a week. 
We actually need to build into our lives the ability to rest daily. We shouldn't burn out for six days and then have a day off where we recover from that. We shouldn't be living that kind of lifestyle. We haven't had the ability to travel overseas. One of the things that we usually do, we look forward to our overseas trip for two weeks, four weeks, whatever it is, um, where we go away and we either rest or we go exploring um, and we party hard. A lot of people party hard waiting for that holiday and that holiday hasn't been able to come because the borders have been closed and a lot of people have really struggled. But really, um, it should be a great challenge to us that living that way is not the way that God wanted us to live. He didn't want us to work really, really hard, basically binge on working and then binge on holidaying. We need to rest, not just once a week, but daily. We need to find ways to incorporate into our lives this restfulness, this coming to Jesus so that we can get our needs met. It's not just in our morning or evening quiet times with God. Many of us don't even do that. But if we did, we'd find things a lot better. But more than that, we should be walking with God every single moment of the day. In many religions, there's rules around when to pray or fast or worship. But not for us Christians. We don't just give a tithe. We give everything we've got because God gave everything he had. We don't just do it some of the time. We don't just do it for one day. We do it all the time. Even when we're working in a way, we should be resting. We should be coming to Jesus. Um, And I find it very interesting, those verses in Matthew, how it says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, if you're burdened, I'll give you rest. But then he says, take my yoke upon you. He doesn't say, stop doing work. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Do things in partnership with me. Continue to work, and you'll find rest for your souls. He doesn't say, I don't have a yoke or a burden. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So that's the point of New Testament Christianity. We live with Jesus, with God and the Holy Spirit continually. We should be putting him first in everything all of the time because there we will find rest for our souls. Jesus doesn't say that he'll take away our burden. He says that he'll give us a light burden if we yoke to him. That is, if we do everything in partnership with him. Should we rest? Absolutely we should. Should we take a break from meeting with Christians and spending time with God over the break? Absolutely not. Now that we're on holiday, we should use this time not to escape from our lives, but to really reinforce our lives. We should be using this time to come to God daily, whether we're by the beach, whether we're uh, by a lake, whether we're at home, wherever it is, we should be spending time every day refreshing our souls with God and setting for ourselves these patterns that we can continue on daily when we get back to normal life. To rest with God is really the only way to truly restore our souls. And then no matter what our life is like, whether we have these times of a couple of years of lockdowns and uncertainty, even in those times, when we come to Jesus, we have everything we need. So here is my resolution for the next year. I've been really challenged in preparing for this message. My resolution is to become more resilient to be less snappy and frustrated and burdened and stressed when things don't go my way, when we have these times of stress and unsettled and um, unknowns happening. So how am I going to do that? By having daily and continual times of rest with God. Not just once a week, not just daily, but as often as I can. As Hebrews 4 verse 9 to 16 says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Actively. Let's actively seek rest. Man, that flies in the face of what a lot of our society tells us. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience as the Israelites did. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And here it really ramps up. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. 
For we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's how Jesus fulfilled the law, by living it out perfectly. Let us then, as we wrap up, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As we celebrated yesterday at Christmas, we have you, you're with us. We celebrate your coming to earth. You're living, you're dying, you're rising again and giving us the Holy Spirit so that we have you. You're with us as a deposit, as a guarantee in our lives of the future things to come. We yearn for something and that something is you. And in eternity, we will have you forever. We will be with you face to face and we won't cease to be filled with love. And that relationship will be finally realized in full. But we thank you that now we can reach out and experience something of you every day, every week, every moment, that we have access to you without need of another human mediator, that we don't have to wait for them to be available, that we don't have to go and sacrifice, that we don't have to pop down to the local chapel and um, confess through somebody else, that we, but that we have your Holy Spirit. Lord, for everybody who's feeling burdened and weary and tired at the end of another long year of another couple of years, some who have been battling things for a decade or more, Lord, we just pray that they would find rest in you at this time, that those burdens would be lifted and that they'll be replaced by a light burden, by the things that you want them to do, that it wouldn't necessarily be free of work, but that that work would, would help to fulfill them and that the rest that they find would be soul-refreshing rest, not just a break. Lord, help us to come to you, to not just seek out distraction or temporary relief, but to come to you for all of our needs, to really dig into you, into your word, the word that divides the soul and spirit and leads us and guides us through life. And we rejoice knowing that one day that deposit that has been in us will be fulfilled, that we will receive you forever and that we will live with you as these songs sing about that yearning, that life continuing on with you forever. Help us to live our lives daily in light of that truth. In Jesus' name, amen.